Keep up, Darren. This mystic tone tells me that the vow of immortality is somewhere hidden in this mansion. I don't think we should be in here, Professor. Something about this place doesn't feel right. Shh! Do you hear that, Darren? The sound is coming from somewhere further up ahead. Hey, Professor! Look at this! This figurine looks so much like you! Intriguing! This one reminds me of you. Professor! You traitor! <laughs> so it is you, darling, that has betrayed me. I finally have the vial of immortality. So shall you be no. forever immortalized. No! Trapped in the board game, Betrayal at House on the Hill. <laughs> Betrayal at House on the Hill is a semi-cooperative board game where players take on the roles of various fictional characters where they explore a haunted mansion, trigger events and ultimately start a haunt where one player in the party becomes the traitor and the rest becomes survivors. The game is split into two phases. In the first phase it is the explore the mansion phase where players try to increase their stats. The second phase is called the haunt phase. And if the traitor meets their victory conditions in the horn phase, they win the game. And if the survivors survive and also meet their goal, they win the game. So it's a tight race between the traitor and the survivors to see who will win first. Betrayal at House on the Hill is designed by Rob DeVille, Bruce Glasgow, Bill McQuillan, Mike Selinka, Tewin Woodruff. It's published by Avalon Hill Games and Wizards of the Coast. It's for three to six players, each game takes about 60 to 90 minutes, it's for ages 12 and over, and it's a dice rolling game which includes a modular board. There are three books that come with the game box. Set aside the Survivor's Handbook and the Trader's Tome. Each player selects a character card and a matching figurine. Each character card is double sided and has some starting attributes denoted by the green writing. Each character has two physical attributes, might and speed, and two mental attributes, sanity and knowledge. The clips that are provided with the board game can get a little bit fiddly, so I would recommend that each player downloads the Betrayal Stats app, which includes all the characters and their starting levels and abilities. Shuffle the omen, event and item deck and place them in easy reach for all players. Locate the basement landing, the entrance hall and the upper landing cards and place them in the center of the game area. Shuffle the room tiles to make one complete deck. Place each figurine at the starting space in the entrance hall. The game is played over two phases, the explore the house phase and the haunt phase. On each player's turn they can move, discover a new room, attempt a die roll, use event or omen cards, attack another player or creature. Players can move around the mansion equal to their character's speed value. When moving past a monster, it always takes that character one more movement to escape or move past the monster. When discovering a new room, players look through the room tile deck until a player locates a room that matches the floor a player is in. They reveal that tile and place it so that it connects with an open doorway. So for example, if I take this ground tile, I can connect this doorway 
from here in the entrance hall to the library. Players must stop and complete their turn in a new room if there is an omen, item or event symbol that is revealed. There are some rooms with special abilities attached to them. For example, the larder room allows a player to gain one might once per game if they end their turn there. In the chasm, if a player wants to cross from one side of the chasm to the other, they need to attempt a speed roll of three or more to cross, otherwise they will not be able to cross. In the graveyard, when a player wants to exit the graveyard, they need to roll a sanity roll four or more, otherwise they lose one knowledge roll, but still are allowed to exit the graveyard. With the vault, um, a character wishing to enter or break into the vault needs to make a knowledge roll of six or more to gain the items that are inside the vault. The coal chute uh, simply transports a player from a particular level down to the basement landing. This tile, the Mystic Elevator, in order to, to move to different floors throughout the house, a player needs to roll two dice and add up the pips and see which floor it matches up with. When a character makes a die roll for a particular trait, they take the number of dice equal to their value of the trait that they're testing. So for example, uh, this character has three sanity, I would use three dice. When a card says take one die of damage, it refers to rolling one die and then taking the value and subtracting it from the area that's specified on the card or room tile. When a player reveals a room with one of the following three symbols, they must immediately draw either an omen card, event card, or item card. If a spiral event card is revealed, follow the instructions and make a die roll attempt if asked to. If a bull head symbol is revealed, draw an item card, read it aloud and place it face up in front of the player. If a raven or omen card is drawn, read it aloud, place it in front of the player and make a haunt roll. Any item or omen cards can be dropped, picked up or traded between a player on the same space once per turn unless a scenario specifies that they cannot do this action. A player can attack another player or creature only in the haunt phase. Players perform an attack when they are on the same tile. Players roll dice equal to their might. Damage is inflicted by determining the difference between the results of the two dice rolls. For example, if player 1 rolls a 2 and player 2 rolls a 6, the difference is 4, therefore player 1 takes 4 pips of physical damage from their stat. If at any time the marker reaches the skull icon in any of the traits, that character dies. Characters cannot die in the first phase of the game. If a character were to go down to the skull icon in the first phase of the game, the marker would sit at the lowest number and go down no further. A player performs a haunt roll after drawing an omen card. If a player performs a haunt roll and the total number is less than the number of omen cards in play, then a haunt is revealed. The person who performed the haunt roll is called the haunt revealer. The haunt revealer looks at the table in the trader's term instruction book and determines who is the trader and then determines which scenario will be played out in the second half of the game. There are 50 scenarios contained in this book. In this situation, we have Darren's character revealing the omen, the holy symbol in the furnace room. Then what you would do is go over to the trader's tome, find the haunt chart, and look for the holy symbol, and look for the room that we're in, which is the furnace room. And therefore, the scenario that the characters will be playing will be number 13. Ooh, a little bit scary there. You then look at the traitor section of the page and look for scenario 13 to find out which character is the traitor. And in this case, it's the character in the game with the lowest sanity, except for the person who revealed the horn. The traitor's term is then given to the traitor and they turn to the haunt that was decided by the table at the front of the trader's tomb, which was to be haunt 13, and then they would read the relevant instructions for their role in the second half of the game. The revealed trader takes the trader's tomb instruction book and leaves the room and reads their instructions away from the heroes. The trader then takes the trader's tomb, leaves the room and reads the corresponding instructions to the selected scenario. The remaining players are considered to be the heroes and read the instructions in the Secrets of Survival book. Once both sides have read their instructions clearly and set up the haunt, the haunt phase begins. The traitor and the heroes do not have to exchange any information about their goals or objectives. Turn order begins with the traitor, any monsters and then the heroes. 
The traitor can now move through rooms without needing to resolve their effects. The scenario contains monsters. They move according to their speed using dice rolls and they can't be killed. They can't carry items and they can't explore new rooms. They can only attack once per creature, once per turn and ignore all room effects. The traitor wins if their conditions are met according to the scenario and vice versa for the heroes. Some scenarios have a hidden traitor. When this occurs, players each take a numbered token and secretly look at their number that's written on the token. If they have the number one on it, then they are the hidden traitor. They do not share this information with the rest of the group. There's lots of things I really enjoy about the game Betrayal at House on the Hill. First of all, it has this really fantastic 80s horror movie style thing where it really is reminiscent of those stories where a group of uh, unsuspecting teenagers get stuck out in the middle of nowhere, uh, a lot of really bad things happen to them and you really get this sense of dread and impending doom, especially with the options that are played in front of you. And you really get this uh, sense that the characters that have been crafted in this game are unique Slightly interesting depending on the layer of depth in terms of character development that you're into But um, it really pays homage to some of those famous horror movie characters that you see What else is really quite good is the fact that whenever you approach this game It's got lots of variability immense replayability because it comes up to uh, with 50 scenarios and if you go onto board game geek there's even more scenarios that other users have created, extending the lifespan of this game with your gaming group. And every time you start the game, especially in the Explore the Mansion phase, the floor plan of the mansion changes whenever you play. And that really can affect the dynamics and the uh, suspense that's created and the conflict that's created within the horn phase. And for example, uh, when you're creating the basement uh, section of the mansion in the explore the house phase, the only way you can get from the basement all the way back up to the other levels is either using the basement landing or the mystic elevator. But there's a lot of tiles that send you to the basement. So if for some reason when you start the haunt, the traitor and the heroes find themselves match to match in the basement and with no way out, it can really make for a very suspenseful and climactic experience. So that is something that really is a highlight. The other thing that's really great about this game is the trader element. In most games, the trader element is a hidden factor of the game, whereas in this game, it's revealed immediately. You know which character is the trader and which player is playing that character as well. And they leave the room and they have to have their own set of rules that they have to follow. And that really makes for a very interesting dynamic and it really sets uh, the players at the table apart from the trader and it really makes uh, the players feel a little bit antagonistic towards each other. And what's also really good is that when the players come back to start the haunt phase, uh, players communicate differently at the table than they did in the beginning phase, where the beginning phase people were more open to uh, discussing where they were, what stats they were going to build up, what they were going to do, whereas in the second phase, the heroes, because they're banding together, tend to keep their conversation a little bit more hushed so that the traitor sitting at the table doesn't know what they're up to. And just that uh, competitive element really makes that second act of this game quite an enjoyable and uh, suspenseful experience. I really like the atmosphere that this game creates. And the first time I really played this game, I really went a little bit out of the way to turn off the lights and light up candles and play uh, really spooky music to really set the ambience and the atmosphere. And I found that made for such a really great experience. Uh, especially for first-time players. People coming into this game for the first time uh, won't be overwhelmed by the rules, but it does need someone to explain or someone who has played the game before to explain the rules as well. But uh, overall, uh, when I've introduced this to new players, it's gone over quite easily and quite well. The other thing is that the combat system in this game is very easy to pick up. It's very easy to learn. Um, it's very easy to teach and it's very easy to grapple. There are some limitations when it comes to the game. First of all, there's an imbalance between scenario to scenario where some scenarios favour the traitor and some scenarios the hero or whether some scenarios simply favour one person over the other characters because of the way the house is set up 
and which characters have which potential items in that scenario that they need. The other thing that's not quite good is that uh, there's a lot of reliance on the luck of the dice in order to improve your traits or sometimes lose your traits, actually most of the time losing your traits, and that uh, when you're trying to beef up your character, you feel that you're um, at a whim of the dice roll. However, the fact that you lose your traits more often than you gain them really adds to that horror theme and that sense of, oh my goodness, these characters are going to die soon, so I better do something about it. The third thing that I'm going to mention is that for first time players, if they end up as the traitor in the haunt phase, it can actually really be overwhelming because not only are the first time players meeting or looking at the rules for the first time or learning them, but they're also learning an additional set of rules for the second phase of the game. So that can really put some of those players off. So what I would recommend is that if a first time player is targeted as the trader, that that trader just gets passed on to the next character or two players can actually swap their characters over so that a more experienced player can really uh, keep the flow of the game going by uh, acquiring the rules and acting as the trader. And that way, the first time player doesn't feel so overwhelmed. In the first phase of the game, when you're setting up the mansion, it can feel quite repetitive and can be quite drawn out, especially if you've played the game 20 times before. Sometimes you just want to get into that haunt phase and find out what scenario that you're playing. And that is the more interesting aspect of the game, is the second half, the haunt phase of the game. And this game really provides little opportunity for advanced planning in the game, because first of all, you don't know who the trader is going to be until the haunt phase is triggered. But also, sometimes when in the haunt phase, if you're the trader, you can see on the board that you are so far behind that if there are lots of other people playing at the table that they have a much more significant advantage for you over you and planning is quite difficult. The gameplay sometimes can feel a little bit clunky, especially when you're moving around the house or when you're trying to work out, okay, with this monster, do I kill it? Does it get stunned? It just doesn't feel as smooth as it could be. And I think if you're approaching this game, I think if you can oversee those minor flaws, you will have a much more enjoyable experience. But for someone entering this game who dwells on those flaws, will find that they will have a much less enjoyable experience. Some of the items that appear or that characters pick up throughout the game are often never used. And some uh, items that are required in the game, especially in the haunt phase for particular scenarios, really comes down to random chance as to which character has randomly picked up that card in the first phase of the game and has luckily or unluckily drawn that card in the second phase of the game. So the actual items themselves could be more strategically placed and strategically set up so that it fits with the scenario that's being played, but also so that it doesn't feel like one character has an item that another character needs. In my discussion point section, I'd like to talk about how this game has a lot of potential for being um, a really great framework for players creating their own user-based scenarios. If you're someone who loves the fantasy dungeon crawler style games um, and loves this horror theme, this is a really great platform or starting point for creating those horror style RPG storytelling moments. So this game, by adding a few more variant rules or a few little variations, you can really create some uniquely uh, interesting horror stories using your own imagination, your own ideas, and the pieces in the game, and they fit very, very well to this theme. This game feels like when you play it that there is the exploration of the house act, there is the trader um, and the haunt phase act, but it feels like it's missing a third act, like something that rounds off the story um, with some really interesting conflict. I think that if the players or the uh, designers of the game actually progress this game into a third act, it would make this game feel a little bit more rounded. And just like in a movie having the initial act and the second act and the third act could really make this game um, up to the next level. I love um, how this game provides opportunities and ideas for storytelling. I like it how that you can take uh, the role of a character 
and pretend to be that character throughout the whole game and explain how they might have changed the behavior, give reasons for their actions. So I think depending on the group of people, if they're up for a storytelling experience, this would be a great game uh, that provides a springboard platform for uh, that storytelling experience, especially with the great horror theme that's attached to it. Next thing I'm going to talk about is the two-player variant. So if you're playing with another partner or a friend and you can't get a group of three or more, um, a really good variant to play is that each person takes two characters or three characters if you want more characters in the game and controls those characters for the first half of the game, the exploration of the house phase. And then in the haunt phase, whichever character's turn it is, if they start the haunt, that player controlling that character takes that character and the traitor's turn and gives their other character over to the other player who then controls all of the heroes. In, this, in the haunt phase of the game. So therefore, you can still create that traitor and betrayal-like element whilst only having uh, two players. However, it doesn't really quite work as well when you're playing a scenario that doesn't have a traitor in it. Uh, so it might mean that if you accidentally reveal one of those sort of scenarios that you might have to add your own variant or you could just go down to the next haunt or the next scenario, and uh, if it's got a trader in it, then it should work quite well. The other thing it doesn't really work for is the hidden trader. So, I think with the hidden trader, those sort of scenarios you probably have to skip. In considering my final verdict, I think this is a really fun light game, especially if you want to take it at Halloween and get your family members or friends involved. It really is a springboard for all those other great horror games out there. Um, but it's an accessible and light game that is quite easy to learn and play. It does, however, have its few kinks. So if you are someone who likes to plan ahead or likes to be more strategic about the moves and doesn't like randomness in a game, this is probably not a game for you, but it's definitely one that can be a very memorable experience with the right group of people, with the right attitudes, with the right mindset. If you'd like to see my review in greater detail, please stay with me after the video. Otherwise, thank you for joining me for another great game review at Board Game Sanctuary. If you like my video, please subscribe. This is Danny signing out. See you next time. Bye.